Welcome to The Straight Hook. I'm your host, Ian Duncan, Li Xing Hui. Today, I'm honored to have with me Lama Jigma Rongdrol, Joe Evans. Joe is a Dzogchen teacher and a translator of root Tibetan texts in the Nyingma lineage. He's the founder of Rongdrol Foundation, through which he presents his teachings in the traditional way, and there's a Sangha there as well. He's studied with many eminent teachers. Perhaps we'll talk about some of those today. Um, but I'm happy to be here with him today. Welcome, Joe. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, so I'd like to lay a little foundation for our listeners uh, in the kind of uh, establishing your runway into the practice and perhaps some details around which uh, how you came to focus on this particular practice among those that you were exposed to. Um, growing up, did you, um, did you have a clear sense of uh, your, a relationship to spirituality or um, philosophy or any, anything that would uh, set the pattern for developing in this way? Um, not really. I think I I lived a pretty normal life as a kid. Um, my family wasn't particularly religious or spiritual or anything like that, but I think that actually created a space of freedom for me to explore. So I was always really encouraged by my mother in particular to to read and explore different ideas. And she was eventually sort of through no intention of her own, really kind of inspired the beginning of my path into uh, Buddha Dharma. And I think through that same kind of attitude of encouragement for exploration and things like that. Um, so from the outside, I don't think there was any kind of particular influence or anything like that. But I remember being really interested in contemplation, even though I didn't really know what anything was. You know, I didn't have some kind of idea. I wasn't like, ah, yes, you know, meditation or spiritual paths or anything like that. But uh, when I was quite young, I did, my mother, again, did enroll me in a martial arts class. I was probably, you know, seven years old and I really enjoyed it. And we would meditate for a few minutes before the beginning of each training session. And that was something that I just always kept with myself after that as I continued to grow up. So I feel like there was always a kind of inclination toward that kind of thing, but nothing, you know, no sort of like grand introduction to a spiritual path or anything like that. Sure. And, and, and at least in that part of the, um, the way it unfolded for you, it's, uh, a sort of practice entrance as opposed to, um, or maybe simultaneously supported by philosophy and poetry type orientation internally or, or not really? Yeah, I think mostly for me, it was probably, like you mentioned, maybe a practice entry in a kind of practical way, but mm -hmm. you articulated that nicely. I've, I've never like thought of it that way. I was like, ah, you know, that's how it began for me. But I think that's probably true. I think there was maybe something that felt very comfortable for me in that space, in that space of internal contemplation, um, finding that kind of clarity within myself, that ability to really kind of observe my own mind, I think came naturally at a young age. And learning to meditate in that context that was something that kind of, that felt natural for me and then as i continued to you know develop and get a little bit older and learn about different traditions and things like this this expanded into a more focused pursuit so to speak would you say that your uh this kind of inner observation um led to a kind of um, self-corrective 
orientation to your experience like uh you know you're you're observing you're you're seeing how these inner dynamics uh, affect outer dynamics and did you find uh you're adjusting you know making it editing to uh editing your approach to the world to make it a better experience i think so um but then again, you know, it's not something that it's that's not something that's so easy, right? No. If that was something that was easy, then people really throughout cultures and millennia, we probably wouldn't have witnessed much of the development of systems in order to yeah. actually engage in that kind of thing. I mean, I, I guess my orientation is that it's easier or sort of natural for some. And uh, it's part of my experience. And so I, I was just sort of fishing for whether yeah. that's part of um, somebody who commits to a path uh, in this way, yeah. that it might be part of your orientation as well. I think so. I think that's true. Um, I also think that maybe, maybe it's a, sometimes it's a little bit turned around, right? Like I think people who are practicing a spiritual path Sometimes we have ideas about ourselves or ideas about other people on spiritual paths. And we say, oh, this person has this kind of inclination. So they must be very good at this kind of thing, or they mm -hmm. must have this kind of disposition or something like that. Whereas, you know, I've done a lot of stupid things over the course of my life. Sure. I've done a lot of stupid things while being a practitioner. Yeah. So maybe sometimes we're drawn towards these paths because we notice that we have these kinds of problems, right? Yeah. And in that sense, to answer your question, I think, yes, absolutely. Like I've yeah. noticed these kinds of mistakes that I've made. I've noticed how those mistakes make me feel, how they impact others mm -hmm. and, you know, want to avoid causing harm to myself and others by applying a method, right? You apply a path. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And the only way that we can really come to that kind of place is through really observing ourselves in an authentic way, right? It's one thing to get to spiritually bypass our experience and be on a path and sort of like put on airs about being a practitioner that doesn't really mean much, right? But if we're really being authentic and reflecting on ourselves and recognizing our our own afflictions and habitual patterns that cause harm, then we can do something about it. Yeah. This is where the path becomes really fruitful. Yeah. So how, how did you uh, start to interface with what was your first exposure to Buddhism and was it simply Dzogchen from the beginning? Um, or did you bounce around in there a bit before finding what resonated most clearly for you? Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> to go back to that kind of origin story, there's there's a there are defining moments. There are moments that they're formative in I think the experience of anybody who's really trying to apply a path you have these kinds of experiences that arise for you and they become they change your orientation or not even necessarily change it but maybe it becomes more focused so for example like I was describing I had this kind of inclination toward contemplative practices and things like this but had no idea what anything was Right? I didn't have any kind of knowledge. And then when I was a teenager, my mother, again, she gave me a book. The, the, there's the two-part autobiography of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. She gave me the first part, My Land and My People. And I remember reading this book and feeling really deeply connected with His Holiness and his story and the Tibetan tradition of Buddha Dharma as a whole and wanted to learn more about this tradition and see if it was something that I could apply myself. So I kind of started there. And then, you know, if 
I'm sure you're familiar with Tibetan Buddhism a little bit, at least enough to know that you know, there's extraordinary diversity in lineage transmissions, different kinds of practices, all of these things. So, so now I've kind of discovered something that I'm interested in, but then I come to find that it's incredibly vast. So I decided that I was going to focus on Buddhism and try to learn some Tibetan language in university. And this is what I did at the University of Michigan. And while I was there, I was fortunate enough to find my first teacher in a serious way. I've kind of, I'd been reading books and I'd participated in a couple of teachings and things like this, but I'd never really kind of established a real relationship with the teacher. And then I met Gallic Rinpoche in Ann Arbor where I was going to school <clears throat> and he was a Galupa Lama. And I studied and practiced with him and did some practice retreats and things like this that were very important for me. But then, you know, the story kind of progressed. And even at that point, like I felt like I was learning a great deal and I discovered, I think I'd pretty solidly decided that this was my path at that time, but I knew that there was more to it. And I always kind of, in the back of in the back of my head knew that <clears throat> eventually I was going to encounter Dzogchen teachings and receive these teachings and so on. But that didn't happen for a few years after that. And I moved to Boston. I was working for Wisdom Publications and started receiving teachings from Chogyal Namkai Norbu because he just he was making them so widely available through webcast for free and things like this. And then that was when the path really started to solidify for me. And um, so was he your first Dzogchen teacher and, and with whom you um, did the Nundro and, and uh, received transmission? Yeah, so Norbu Ripshe was the first person that I received Dzogchen teachings from in a serious way. Uh, he didn't require his students to do this kind of formal nundro, this tantric style nundro. But I had been strongly conditioned by my previous experience um, as a Vajrayana practitioner. So I still felt like it was very important that I did nundro. So I did nundro. Uh, I started with the Long Chen Ding Tik nundro. This is a part of the tradition that. Norba Rinpoche was a part of, and then eventually I started to do Kundang Dechen with those Pedma Song Tik Nundro. Uh, very similar in structure, but just a different lineage that I have a particular connection with. So I still did this practice and then, you know, eventually did another one when I did the Chetsan Ning Tik Nundro. But this is, this is my condition, right? Norba Rinpoche didn't, he didn't require people to do this. He taught Dzogchen as a complete yana, which it is. It's, it's its own vehicle and he taught from this perspective and to some people this seems like it's not very traditional but it's really a lot more traditional he teaches he taught Dzogchen in Dzogchen's own terms mm -hmm. rather than teaching Dzogchen as though it's an add-on path to Vajrayana Buddhism mm -hmm. but at that time I wasn't quite there yet so I had to do these kinds of practices, but they didn't require this. Well, from the way you phrase that, I mean, it sounds like um, in retrospect, uh, those Nundro served an important purpose for you, um, not just expression of kind of how you saw things at that time or yourself, um, but they did a work, they did a, a kind of work in you yeah, I think they were certainly useful for me. Yeah. And I think that's actually, it's a really important point, I think, because if you if you spend any time on the internet reading the things that people debate and discuss about Tibetan Buddhism and Dzogchen, you've probably encountered this ongoing debate that's never going to be resolved about some teachers with the opinion that everybody has to complete a nundro before they can receive any kind of Dzogchen teachings. And then there are other teachers like Norbert Rinpoche who say that this isn't necessary and so on. Mm -hmm. And this debate kind of goes on and on and on. And it's, 
it's not useful and it will never reach any kind of fruition. Yeah. But what I find useful is when teachers guide students based upon where the student is at. Right. Because really any path isn't, it's not an assembly line, it's not a factory. Yeah. You know, we're not just kind of like creating the same model of a practitioner over and over and over again. Everybody right. has their disposition, everybody has their own afflictions, everybody has their own circumstances. So skillful teachers allow students to discover their own circumstances and then they guide them with methods that will lead them to a real discovery of their own nature, of their natural state. Yeah. So having a teacher like Chogyal Namkai Norbu, who always emphasized the essence of the teachings as Dzogchen teachings, but he also transmitted and taught all of these various other methods mm. so that then students could work with their own circumstances in order to enter into the actual state of Dzogchen. Mm -hmm. And this is what I find to be particularly useful. And this has actually been, really, this is the attitude of all of my teachers, really, especially toward me personally. I've been really fortunate to have teachers that gave me Dzogchen teachings and then helped me navigate how to actually understand those teachings and apply them mm -hmm. in the best possible way. Yeah. So as you make those kinds of choices um, as a teacher, um, do you find you're presenting options and then uh, making it the student's responsibility to choose uh, the ones that suit them? Or is it more like, I can see that you you need to do this um, uh, in order to clarify some things or open some things or whatever the orientation is? Um, how are you approaching that uh, in your teaching? Yeah. For me and for students in the Wrong Girl Sangha, we, there's a lot of emphasis placed upon collaboration. and there are a couple of factors to this, you know, it's, you can imagine a scenario in Tibet before the Chinese invasion where you either had the option of, or the opportunity to live in close proximity to your teacher. So you're collaborating in real time in this kind of way, or, you know, maybe your teacher walked through passed through your village and gave some empowerments and transmissions, and then you never saw them again, or maybe you saw them again the next year or something like this. So <clears throat> there was a lot of diversity there, just like there's a lot of diversity in the way that teachers and students interact now. Mm -hmm. But like I, I mentioned before, my teachers, they were available to me. They always answered my questions, responded to my emails and things like this. And we never, other than my experience living close to like Gellar Krimpache and some of my other teachers, but my primary Zogchen teachers, I never like lived close to them. Sure. I wasn't, you know, their personal attendant or anything like this, right? right? But they always were present for me. They always answered my questions and so on. Mm -hmm. So the way that I teach and the way that I've conceived the Wrong Girl Foundation is that it's a collaborative community of practitioners. And there are a couple of things that allow this to function. And one of them is that there's no, there's no like membership dues or, you know, fees or anything like that. You, know, it's, you don't have to, you don't have to buy into anything mm -hmm. in order to participate. So anybody can participate in the teachings, you know, everything's donation based. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sure, like there's a suggested donation for retreats and things like that. But at the same time, you know, there's not a fire, there's not a barrier here, right? right for anybody. And we also don't have any kind of physical structures, you know, like I, we don't have to pay for a temple or anything right. like that. So this makes it pretty easy, 
for people to collaborate in this way. And this allows me to dedicate all of my time mm -hmm. to teaching. And this doesn't just mean that I'm, you know, I'm sitting here in front of the computer talking all the time or something like this, but I'm available to collaborate with people. So for example, we just finished a retreat in which I taught the 21 Themsins, these, these practices for nakedly exposing one's own rigpa, right? They're these very simple but profound methods. And we always then have new people that enter into our forum on, on the internet, right? So there's a lot of questions and things like this. So I am able to teach something for a few days. And then I'm able to respond to everyone's emails and questions in the Sangha Discord group continuously. Mm -hmm. So even though we're working from different spaces in the physical world, we still have this opportunity for ongoing, nearly real-time collaboration. Mm -hmm. So I can actually get to know people. People can actually share with me what their experiences are, what their doubts are, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then I can help them discover a method yeah. that's going to work for them. Yeah. So it's not it's not one or the other. So sort of like in to kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but you kind of asked this question of is it it's the student's responsibility to determine what works for them, or am I kind of like deciding, oh, you should do this, you should do that. Yeah. Uh, whereas it's really in the middle. It's in between those things because um, I I'm not, you know. A realized person i can't be like oh this person needs to do you know a lot more purification practice or something like that mm -hmm. and i also don't want anyone who's participating in my sangha to feel as though they're kind of you know in the wilderness mm -hmm. and they have to fix something right. you know right. so it's in between we're always trying to collaborate with each other so everybody can really have the best opportunity to discover the real essence of the teachings through whatever methods are appropriate for them. And that's based upon that relationship. Yeah. So um, how do you navigate uh, for yourself and for those in your Sangha, the it feels like the same question in a different way, actually. But the um, the sort of paradox of practice and non-practice that the Dzogchen view um, presents. Maybe we should um, uh, maybe I'll ask you to, to articulate uh, what's different about the Dzogchen view uh, first. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Maybe the easiest way to describe this a little bit is that <clears throat> when we look at a lot of other paths in Buddhist teachings, for example, we are we're working with the idea that we are kind of we have to limit our exposure, right, in our conduct. So we limit the kinds of things that we come in contact with. It's kind of a part of the sutra approach, right? So we are identifying situations and stimuli that cause our afflictions to arise, right? And we're also applying this kind of point of view of analysis where we're trying to recognize that all phenomena have no actual intrinsic existence. So we're kind of analyzing, you know, we're examining with our mind, with our thoughts and things like this. So we're cultivating attitudes and states of mind, states of concentration, uh, states that are conceptually virtuous as opposed to non-virtuous. And then in Vajrayana practices, we have this principle where we're trying to transform everything from our ordinary impure perception into pure perception with deities and mandalas and so on and so forth. So we're always working with our mind in some way. We're always kind of manufacturing something context. But in Dzogchen teachings, you're not changing anything. You're not restricting or shutting anything out. In order to actually discover the view of Dzogchen, that discovery is the key point. So you can 
put these two things in juxtaposition. So in the context of many paths, we have this kind of cultivated conceptual point of view or this idea that we have to transform into something else. Mm -hmm. And in Dzogchen, you're discovering the nature that's always been perfectly pure, yet has the potentiality for infinite manifestation and so on. Mm -hmm. And this is what all of the methods in Dzogchen teachings are helping you discover. Mm -hmm. And since Dzogchen teachings are considered to be the culmination and the essence of all nine yanas mm -hmm. in this nine yana breakdown that we see in Yingma teachings anyways, we can then understand that any of the methods that are presented in the nine yanas are at the disposal of the Dzogchen practitioner in mm -hmm. order to enter into that state. Mm -hmm. So we're going beyond any kind of limitation in this way because we're always functioning with our mind. This is one of the other things that I think kind of gets a little bit lost in the way that a lot of people think about Dzogchen teachings. It's like, oh, you know, there's, there's nothing to change or you just rest in awareness or something like this. Mm -hmm. If you have thoughts and ideas and concepts, this is somehow automatically negative. Mm -hmm. This really isn't very helpful because we're living almost all of our lives with the functioning of our mind. We need our minds in order to function, mm -hmm. in order to live an ethical, healthy life. We need to rely upon these things. So what do we do? We try to actually discover that nature. And then when we're functioning with our mind, we try to integ integrate that discovery into all of our experience. So we're always reflecting on the teachings. We're trying to be a little bit more calm so that we can be the kind of person that responds to situations and stimuli, as opposed to the kind of person who reacts based upon our afflictions. Mm -hmm. So you discover something for yourself. And this discovery is your nature, the nature of your own mind, the nature of your entire dimension you discover. Because all of your experience is your body, voice, and mind unified. Mm -hmm the expression of the potential of your nature. So when you have this knowledge, then you try to integrate everything into that discovery. Yeah. Um, um, so would you say that the, the sutra and tantric levels of practice, um, how does it break down? Is it in the yanas, is it three, three, and three, or is it just a... Um... Yeah, so we have these... Um, <clears throat> We have the Prateka Buddhayana, the Shravakayana, the Bodhisattvayana, and then we have the outer tantras and the inner tantras. Okay. This up. Yeah. So there's, you know, and each one of these has its own specific function, purpose, and they work with the inclination of individuals, right? right. But they're all teachings of Buddha Dharma. So right. they're presented in this hierarchical kind of way. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you really have some knowledge of your own state, this kind of top-down approach, can, it also disintegrates a little bit. You're not sort of like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a Zogchen practitioner, and the rest of these vehicles, they're kind of, you know, they're not so great. Yeah, it all ends up being simultaneous, essentially. Right, this kind of, this erodes yeah. for you. It's not as though you're feeling some sense of superiority, but it's rather that you actually, it's a classic example is that you're standing on the top of the highest mountain in a mountain range. Mm -hmm. You can now see all the, the peaks and valleys below you. Mm -hmm. And if you actually can directly experience and see something clearly, then you can decide clearly on what needs to be done, what doesn't need to be done and so on and so forth. So yeah. you apply any methods that function for your practice. And your teacher should hopefully help you discover these methods that will actually benefit you as a practitioner. So would it be accurate to say that uh, all of the lower, whether it's six or eight lower uh, yanas, accurately understood are also aimed at discovery? Yeah, from the perspective of Dzogchen teaching, certainly. You know, okay. we also... 
And I think probably from the perspective of all of these yanas in their own right, you know, we all, we understand that the Buddha had this kind of discovery. He discovered the state that was peaceful. It was ineffable, beyond a description, and so on. Yeah. This discovery, this is the state of Dzogchen. Yeah. So whether or not we're talking about a vehicle in and of itself, right. guiding a practitioner to that discovery, or these vehicles kind of gradually on road on ramping someone to Dzogchen teachings. Mm -hmm. The outcome really is the same ultimately, and the intention is the same. The intention is to overcome dukkha, to yeah. go beyond the state of dukkha and discover that state that the Buddha himself discovered. So is the um Is the emphasis and kind of the existence of the Dzogchen lineage as a distinct lineage, does that begin with uh, Sakyamuni Buddha? Or does that, uh, is that a, a later emphasis saying, you know, actually, you know, this is the point? Yeah, we have, in Dzogchen teachings, we have these, these 12 Buddhas, okay? and we count Sakyamuni Buddha amongst them, but this doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, Dzogchen practitioners are going around and saying, oh yeah, Shakyamuni taught Dzogchen okay. teachings and things like this, right? Yeah. Because, you know, historically this wouldn't really make much sense, right? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the way that we can really understand it though is that Garab Dorje, about three centuries after Shakyamuni, okay. is considered to be the, the first person in this world system, this dimension, to teach Dzogchen teachings, the first person to express the tantras. Yeah. But you know, it's it's interesting because one of the these things that we discover in Dzogchen teachings is that, for example, we have the teachings on Buddha nature, right? Like we find these teachings in Sutra teachings, we find them in Vajrayana teachings and so on. And they become more refined and nuanced in their presentation. Mm -hmm. So then you get to Dzogchen teachings and Dzogchen teachings are explaining in great detail this topic. So it's a little bit more like this kind of unfolding of the teachings into their most refined state mm -hmm. that we find in Dzogchen teachings. You know, it's like, Another classic example is like churning milk into butter, right? Yeah. And then eventually you get the, you know, the sweetest, smoothest butter. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think you answered the kind of practice, no practice question. Um, when, and also, you know, you have to practice, right? Mm -hmm. This is another aspect of things, right? Like sometimes it's a little bit easy to get this idea. Oh, if everything's just, you know, totally pure and perfect from the beginning, then I don't have to do anything. Right. But obviously this isn't true, right? Like we have afflictions. We have right. these problems that we have to overcome. So we have to practice diligently in order for the path to actually function. Right. And that takes different shapes based upon the student and their disposition, right? Like some people, like this is to go back to previous discussion too, like early on I was very conditioned by the idea that I had to be reciting Vajrayana sadhanas every day. Like this was like, this is what I thought practice was. Mm -hmm. is that I sit down and I recite these little books every day and I recite a certain number of mantras and so on. Sure. And I have this kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And for many people, this is very much what practice looks like for them. And that can either be a perfectly functioning practice or it can just kind of be like a routine, right? right. right. And then there are other people who maybe it's much better for them to practice methodologically in a very simple way 
and then to really spend as much of their time as possible trying to be mindful and integrate the teachings that they've heard from their teachers and the discovery that they've had through their own practice into all of their experience in ordinary daily life. Yeah. And eventually, you know, no matter what kind of where you fall on this spectrum, you eventually have to come to this place where you're always integrating the teachings in your experience anyway. Yeah. Because, you know, frankly, like sitting down and reciting mantras or, you know, trying to do some kind of shamatha meditation or even just, you know, sitting and trying to practice triksha or something like this for a couple of hours a day and then spending the rest of your time in a state of distraction, this, it might help you a little bit, but it's not going to get the job done, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I went to China in 2008, my teacher, we, uh, we stayed at a, the Dragon Gate Caves Temple and we we're talking to um, a couple of the priests and somebody asked, um, you know, how much practice should we do? Uh -huh. And uh, the priest who answered said, um, you know, if you can do 12 hours a day, you might make some progress. Um, and it was only much later that I realized he meant 12 Chinese hours, which are double hours, 24 hours a day. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, this is really, this is the approach that Dzogchen practitioners really need to take in their path and in their practice. Right? Yeah. Because if you're just being distracted, you're not recalling the teachings at all. Right. You're not living your life as a practitioner. Right. Your practice is something that you do as a part of your life. Whereas it should be the other way around. Your life should be your practice. Sure. Your practice shouldn't just be something that you do in the morning before you go to work or go to school and then become distracted and whatever, right? Yeah. You have to actually try to live in this way. So it'd be accurate to say from your understanding experience that um, that having recognized the natural state, um, that one's natural, it's, it's simply the natural unfolding of one's uh, inevitable behavior that one practices? Yeah, so in a sense, yes, this is, the way that it's going to occur, the way that this unfolds is that once you have discovered this natural state, so you encounter the teachings, you encounter a teacher, they give you transmission, they give you some methods to apply. And then gradually over time through your own diligence, you start to have this discovery. So you discover your own natural state. And then based upon that discovery, you now have knowledge. Right? You have some clear experience. You have a direct perception of your own state because it's something that you've discovered. It's not mm -hmm. something, it's, it doesn't remain just something that some teacher told you about or something that you read in a book, right? It's, yeah. it's a real experience for you. You have this discovery. And then since you have this kind of knowledge, it's like having tasted chocolate for the first time, right? People can explain chocolate to you over and over again. But if you've never had it, you'll never know. Mm -hmm. But once you do have it, you're not going to forget. It's not something that you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. So now you can actually start to experience your life a little bit differently. An example that I like to use for students in the Ram Girl Sangha is the, if we break apart this name in the lineage tradition, we have the name for these tulkus, these reincarnations of Jigme Lingpa is Kiense. So if you're familiar at all with Nyingma Buddhism in particular, the Nyingma lineage, you'll, this name will be familiar to you. Like we've got Jamyang Kiense Wangpo and Dilgo Kiense, Kiense Choki Lodro, and so on. But this 
name or this title, it has a very useful meaning for practitioners to understand. So this first word, kin, this means real knowledge. So for example, when people are referring to Longchenpa, they use this honorific, kun kin. Kun means total, everything. So this is gets translated as omniscient. If you're reading a book about Longchenpa's teachings or something like this, you'll see omniscient Longchenpa or the omniscient one. This is a translation of kun kin. And it's a specific kind of knowledge, kin. It means that you have real knowledge of the way things are. Mm -hmm. Neluk, this word that means the way things actually are, mm -hmm. right? So you have this kind of knowledge. This is kin. This is what it means to say kun kin, long champa. Okay. So we can equate this experience, this kin, this knowledge, to actually being in that state. So for example, you're sitting and you do your practice and then you remain, you're relaxing in this state. This is Dzogchen. And now based upon this direct perception, this actual view that's not based on concepts, you have real knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then the second word in this name, it's say, and this means love. So this means actual, love and affection. So now you arise from your session and you're judging, you're thinking, your mind is functioning, right? But you have this knowledge, this can. You have real knowledge about the way things are. Mm -hmm. Based upon this knowledge, you also understand that all sentient beings, infinite sentient beings, have this same potentiality. And if you reflect upon this and you bring this to mind, you will naturally have love and compassion for them in an uncontrived way. Mm -hmm. You'll be more gentle. You'll be a more caring person and so on yeah. without cultivating some sort of spiritual attitude yeah. in which you think you're supposed to be a kind and compassionate person. Yeah. You actually become one because you have real knowledge of the way things are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the Qing Ding Jing in the Taoist liturgy, uh, uh, Lao Tzu says uh, the higher virtue is not carried out, the lower virtue is carried out, the lower virtue is not the virtue of the Tao. Um, I think it has the same meaning um, that you're describing, where the higher virtue is simply um, in the state of. Uh, Clarity and stillness and state of recognition in the natural state, um, one's natural pattern is in alignment with uh, the virtue of the Tao, which is just uh, the way it put the way the pattern unfolds. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, as uh, it's not actually being critical of the lower virtue, it's just simply saying it's a lower level. Um, uh, but one you know, applies the principles of virtue in order to become in alignment, uh, but it's a different state. Uh, so I think that's so, similar. Yeah, so these kind of, these things, these themes in our discussion link up too, right? Yeah. So for example, we were talking about how to determine what kind of method a student applies. And mm. so yeah. this is the kind of collaboration and guidance that people need in order to actually come to that state of ken, where mm -hmm. they have the kind of real knowledge. So that then this natural expression of the potentiality of their own state can actually shine forth, mm -hmm. rather than just being left as an idea, a kind of spiritual idea, like you're saying, this kind of lower path versus higher path, right? Mm -hmm. if, if we're gonna like structure this kind of hierarchy, this kind of hierarchical set of paths, we can see that one is based upon, you know, kind of creating a contrived attitude that's virtuous. Yeah. And the other one is actually just having your manifestation be that of virtue, because that's actually your natural state from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit of stepping uh, stepping back, but perhaps it'll 
take us forward into something else. I'm curious about um, both the um, kind of differences in the Nundro from your different, the different times that you did it with different teachers, and also um, the experience of going through it and what was the felt change if, if that was part of the experience. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's definitely a, a felt change in my attitude between the first time I did Nundro and then the second time I did. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I feel like the first time I did it, I did it because I felt like I was supposed to. Mm. Just to put it simply, I was like, oh, this is something that I'm supposed to do as a practitioner. I want to be a serious practitioner, so I have to do this, right? Yeah. I have this kind of attitude. Um, so I did it and it was it was useful for me. Like we mentioned before, you know, I had experiences that arose from that practice that were very useful and indicative of the practice functioning mm -hmm. for me, even though I, you know, maybe had an idea that that was the case at the time, but, you know, there are certain signs and indications that can arise in dreams and things like this. And I had these kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. It was very useful. And it also, you know, like anytime, even on a more practical level, though, I think anytime someone does decide to do any kind of serious retreat or kind of takes a practice commitment like this and you do it and you finish it, then you've started something and you finished it. Hmm. And every day we're engaging in startings and finishings hmm. of things. And if we're observing ourselves, we notice that we start a lot of things and we don't finish them. But this path is a path that leads to the fruition. So you embark on this path and you should understand that it's not something that is immediate, right? We have this kind of idea of having some grandiose experience right away. And we always think, oh, I'm, you know, I'll be a Buddha tomorrow or something like this, right? Yeah. But what you have to understand is that this is a lifetimes long practice. And I'm saying like lifetimes plural for right. many of us. Like we're engaging in this path diligently so that we can actually really discover the fruition. So when you engage in a kind of practice retreat, you start to develop the experience of starting something and finishing it that's associated with your path. And this in and of itself, I think is very virtuous and really profound because you start to really learn how to be committed to the path. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's some people I'm sure don't need this. You know, I think I needed it. I feel like I, I feel like I felt like I was very dedicated to the path, but also, you know, I needed something to maybe bring me down a little bit. You know, I was very, I was like kind of rigid, mm. you know, all these things. Yeah. I, think I needed to exhaust some of that energy. Mm -hmm. And then later when I did Nundro again, I did it as opposed to because I thought it was something I was supposed to do. I did it because it was something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, did this Nundro. And again, I had, you know, really favorable indications and signs that arose for me. Mm -hmm. But that time I was so much more relaxed because I was, you know, I was doing what I wanted to do. I would get up in the morning and I'd say, oh, I'm going to do my Nundro practice. I, so you did it. So you interrupt. You did it as part of life, or is it a compressed? Uh, well, I did it, you know, in a in sessions on my cushion in the morning and things yeah. like that. But but I think my overall attitude allowed me at that point, as my practice had matured a little bit, to to be that boundary between session and out of session. Mm. It's you know becomes. It starts to you know dissolve a little bit, even if you're doing a formal kind of practice. 
So I was able to actually apply this kind of method in a way that was much more spacious and open mm -hmm. and relaxed because my attitude had changed mm -hmm. in that direction over time. You know, I went from being this kind of, you know, rigid, I have to do this, you know, yeah. attitude to a, a much more kind of open and relaxed kind of attitude and approach to my own path. Yeah. And the first time you do it, did it, you were early 20s or something, and the second time you were late yeah. 20s or something? Yeah. Yeah. I actually did the second second time I did Nundra was just a few years ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that the difference in between is pretty striking. And I kind of, I use this example fairly regularly too of my own path so that hopefully it's useful, a useful example. Yeah for people who are maybe newer to practice, but for quite some time, I've noticed that every several years, I would come to a place in my practice where I would kind of have this feeling like, okay, I understand now. I really understand the teachings. Yep. And then seven years or so would pass. And I would then I would be like, now I really understand it. <laughs> I would look back on myself seven years ago and be like, wow, that guy, he thought he understood the teachings, but no idea. <laughs> so this, I think this is something that happens for practitioners when you're on the path for a certain amount of time is that maybe you don't necessarily notice, you know, in the moment mm -hmm. when your practice is developing. It's not like you're sitting and doing your practice one morning and you're like, oh, wow, that's, you know, Eureka. Something right. like this. Sure. Of course, these kind of experiences occur where you, you know, you have some kind of, you know, experience in your practice in this way. Yeah. But my personal experience is that it's much more gradual that, you know, over time, I can then reflect on where I was in my life, what my attitudes were like, what my state of mind was like. Mm -hmm what my physical health was like, all of these different aspects of our experience. And then I noticed how the path has impacted all of these aspects of my life and experience. But this occurs at a gradual pace. So it's it's something that I notice over longer spans of time sure. as opposed to necessarily being like, oh, one day my practice was like this. And then the next day it was completely different or something like that. Yeah. I feel like it's often both. I wonder if that's part of your experience. Um, of course, uh, sudden moments need qu uh, quite a bit of integration and time to yeah. you know, understand what's happening. Yeah, it seems like those sudden moments, maybe you have this kind of momentary experience, you know, and then you have to work at integrating that, and that's what takes the time. Yeah. Right. And, um, was there a sudden moment or or a culmination of gradual moments um, after which uh, the scripture to you um, kind of you realized it suddenly makes sense or suddenly it made sense? Yeah, I think there's a couple of defining moments for me that really kind of helped a lot of pieces fall into place. And they really arose in a couple of different kinds of experiences for me. I think initially I had what I what I would categorize as my real first clear moment of going beyond doubt. So in Dzogchen teachings, we have these three statements of Garab Dorje. We have direct introduction. So this is, you know, the teacher is explaining Dzogchen teachings to you. Maybe they perform some kind of ritual or they use a symbol or something like this. This is direct introduction. So you're receiving transmission from a teacher. You're now a part of this lineage, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people don't necessarily have this kind of discovery in that moment. You know, it's not like, oh, now I get it. It's right. quite unusual. So really what teachers have to do is they have to give students a method at this point that they can utilize in order to actually have this discovery. 
And then based on applying that method and doing this practice, then you decide on one thing. But Chogyal Namkai Norbu used to say, refer to this statement as going beyond doubts. Hmm. So you go beyond having doubt about your path, about that which you were introduced to. Hmm. And for me, this occurred really, I think, a defining moment. I was sitting out on my patio in this apartment that I rented and I was practicing guru yoga. And in this, our practice of guru yoga, we sing this song of the Vajra that's from the Dzogchen Tantras. And I'm sitting outside and I'm singing and I have this experience of clarity and I'm fully integrated in the experience of the sound, the sound arising from my own state. And at this moment I was like, okay, I've had you know, real, this real clarity that allows me to decide on one thing, mm. to no longer have doubts about my path and so on. So I had this kind of very experiential approach to this. Mm -hmm. And through this, I then, you know, things become more and more clear. Like then you go and you read a text or something that maybe wasn't so clear before, then you kind of, it makes a little bit more sense because you can relate it to your experience, right? Yeah. And then I think the other for me was probably, um, I have a, this kind of sense of devotion to my teachers, mm -hmm. uh, like real respect for my teachers and devotion to them and the teachings that they've given me and a great deal of gratitude. And in particular, I think I have a lot of devotion to my guru, Dungse Rigsen Dorje Rinpoche, who gave me, who gave this incredible teaching on the Yeshe Lama. And it was this line by line commentary and he explained everything very well, very beautifully. And it was a really intimate setting and things like this. And he then gave, uh, after that he gave an empowerment into what's been one of my main practices, my main deity practice after this. And he, He's just, he, to me, just exudes qualities of someone who has this capacity of can say, like I was explaining before, he's, mm -hmm. he's incredibly kind and gentle and kind of quiet. He's an extraordinary teacher. You know, he's, you know, he's not a very famous or well-known person and he lives far away and all these things. He doesn't really tour and teach or anything like that, but I've always had a great deal of devotion to him. And when I received this teaching from him, I told him, I said, this is, you know, this is my path. I'm going to devote myself to this path. And he says, you know, this is very good, you know, very simple. And I think when these two things come together, mm -hmm. in my experience anyways, when your devotion to the path and the blossoming of your experience of that path, when these things merge, mm -hmm start to make a lot more sense for you mm -hmm. places where you had doubt or confusion start to naturally dissolve and that's been my experience and it's also been my experience that we overcomplicate things a mm -hmm. great both in when we're trying to learn something intellectually and also when we're just trying to do our practice we make things much more complicated than they have to be yeah. 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 So um, I noticed one of your upcoming offerings is the uh, a teaching on a year long teaching on the flight of the Garuda, and that you translated it yourself. And um, part of my previous question was. Um, Sort of wondering at the the your own uh, relationship to uh, translating a text like that and and coming from uh, you know it strikes me um, that one can be working with uh, the language to um, Kind of bring oneself closer to the meaning, or one can be working from the meaning 
with this first iteration of the language to then bring it to language again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you have to do, I think it's important that you do a little bit of both mm -hmm. of these, right? So when I'm going through a text and I'm trying to prepare something for the Sangha and something that I'm going to explain, I'm I'm very slow because you know, first of all, you know, I'm not I'm not a professional translator by any means, you know, but I'm slow and I go through the text because I'm examining words and meanings as best as I can. And I'm also learning a great deal when I do it. So it's I'm developing my own capacity to explain things because I'm going through this kind of investigation. And rather than just kind of like seeing a word and saying, oh, this means this, or it gets translated this way by these other people or something like this, mm -hmm. it's, it's nice for me to be able to actually look at these, some of these terms in a little bit more depth and detail and try to explain some of this nuance for people mm -hmm. so that maybe they get a little bit more well-rounded expression of the actual meaning mm -hmm. of the text. So looking at something through that lens, through the lens of a little bit of both, like, okay, for example, take Flight of the Gruta as the example. Shabgar, Shabgar is trying to express the meaning of trickcho, mm -hmm. words and meanings. These words and meanings are expressed in a different language. I'm going to look at these words and meanings in Tibetan, and then I'm going to try to convey them in English. And then sometimes it's also very interesting and useful to look at the way that Sanskrit terms are used, the way that different terms are used in different contexts based upon the teachings and so on. And then you can explain things a little bit more thoroughly and clearly. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very useful for me as a teacher to be able to take the time to do this kind of textual study in mm -hmm. order to present something to other practitioners. Are you finding that um, when you encounter some parts of the language or one particular term or something that um, you uh, discovered a clear, not dis you know, I don't know, you arrived at a, at a um, understanding and now translation that was significantly different from the generation or two uh, before us that translated it in ways that A, made it clearer to you, but also felt like you could make it more clear to your students. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there are several examples of different terms that we see that have kind of become maybe routine translations, Yeah, you know? Um, and they've just kind of become the accepted translation for certain terms. And so one translator repeats it because these yeah. time. Uh, yeah, and then it just kind of becomes what everyone's using. Yeah. And I think a lot of these terms were established, you know, probably in the 90s and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the times they they don't have an English equivalent necessarily. Mm -hmm. And even if they did, they would still require a great deal of explanation in order mm -hmm. to make the term make sense. And one of the things that I benefited from is as being a student of Chogyal Namkai Norbu, is that he spoke excellent English. He mm -hmm. also spoke excellent Italian. And of course, he spoke excellent Tibetan. Yeah. So he was able to convey things in ways that were a lot different than what people might be hearing other teachers say who maybe 
didn't know as much English or what we were seeing in a lot of translations. Mm -hmm. So he would refer to things in ways that were, like I said, different, you know? For example, Rigpa, a very important word in Dzogchen teachings. And everywhere we look, we see this word translated as awareness. Mm. Norba Rinpoche never called Rigpa awareness because it's not really what it means. You know, it's a, awareness is a factor of one's Rigpa because, of mm -hmm. course, you know, when you're in that state of knowledge, you're perfectly aware, right? But it's, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't capture the breadth of the term. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> in, in fact, like a, a better word for awareness would maybe be something like Brempa. It gets translated as mindfulness, right? Mm -hmm. But it also has this meaning of, you know, to recall, to remember, to be aware, and so on. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> he would refer to it as instant presence for Rikpa. And in particular, we have this, this expression of Rikpa, Rikpa ke chikma. And this is instant presence. So this means that here, instant meaning it's, it's uncreated. It's instant. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. always there. Yeah. And it's presence, your natural presence, right? Mm -hmm. So your natural state from the beginning is instant presence. Mm -hmm. It's originally pure from the beginning. Infinite manifestations can arise within your perception and so on. So he would use this kind of description. Mm -hmm. right? So we see a lot of differences in terminology and also the way that Norbert Ripshe, for example, would describe Trekcho. So a lot of times we see people translate this word trekcho as to thoroughly cut or something mm -hmm. like this. And this is both a bit of a mistake and it's also too literal at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we have this word trek. Trek means to bind something. A trek is something that binds, right? A classic example is like a cord that holds a bundle of sticks or a bundle of hay together. Okay. And then chud, this is very similar to the active verb of to cut, but here it has more of a meaning of to unbind or to release. Okay. And since we're talking about your mind, we're talking about your consciousness, if we take this a little bit further, what are we doing? You're not really doing anything. But what's happening is that you're naturally unbinding mm -hmm. releasing that which binds you which is your tensions your afflictions your fixations mm -hmm. and so on so this yeah. means that you're in a state of total relaxation of instant presence mm -hmm. so rather than saying cutting through to awareness we're saying that you're completely unbound and free of tensions Mm -hmm. in your naturally perfected instantaneous state of presence yeah pretty different from hunting and killing your prey right. <laughs> yeah right. and, and you know we find this kind of description based upon this term you know people say oh you know trek shows that you're cutting through thoughts mm. this you know this misses the mark in the actual meaning it might be a somewhat literal way of trans translating these terms. But if we can actually discover the meaning, we're not engaging in some sort of destructive cut through right. to anything else. Right. Rather, we're directly experiencing our own state. And in that state, all of our tensions naturally are unbound. Mm -hmm. Ripshay would always discuss this as being in a state of total relaxation. Yeah. When you would describe Trekjo. And it doesn't mean that you're just kind of, you know, like relaxed afterward or something, right? Because mm -hmm. instant presence, right? Nothing's obstructed. You're not obstructing anything, mm -hmm. but you're completely relaxed. Yeah. Interesting. So when you're when I'm translating something that I'm going to share with people. I'm trying to, you know, incorporate both 
a meaningful translation of the words themselves mm -hmm. with the meaning that they're trying to convey. Like I was saying before, you know, like Flight of the Guru, Shabbat mm -hmm. is trying to convey this meaning. Now, as a teacher who's working with the text in its original language, you, you have to work with discovering how to convey that meaning in a language that everybody else can understand. Yeah. Yeah. Do you also find in kind of reflecting now on uh, probably at least a couple it sort of, at least in the academic sense, generational uh, iterations of a translation that you notice um, uh, kind of generational biases, cultural biases that um, uh, you're also able to uh, shed this time around? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, there are a couple of challenges, I think, for translation in general, and especially when things become kind of deeply rooted in that way, mm -hmm. is that people have a natural inclination to make things sound nice. Mm -hmm. Are you like, oh, the, maybe I can convey this in a more elegant kind of way. Right. But sometimes that makes things a little bit unclear. It makes yeah. them bit harder to understand yeah so it's a fine line i think between making something sound very nice or interesting and actually trying to convey its meaning mm -hmm. and sometimes this is really just kind of like i said there aren't equivalents for a lot of terms you know right so this becomes i think very difficult for people especially in if you're just translating something and then it's just being published into a book and it's not being explained, right. then it becomes really difficult because then people are reading it and then they can get mistaken ideas about what things mean. Right. Whereas really for each term, you need this kind of, to walk this circle of uh, ideas, to fill it out and then uh, it can be available to you when you come across that term. And this is also, you know, like when, when I'm teaching, for example, we do every Thursday night, there's a, a teaching. We've been doing these Thursday teachings for quite some time. And for these, usually I'll use someone else's translation, but it still provides this opportunity as mm -hmm. we're going through. So there's a difficult term or a phrase that has this kind of pattern of just repeating a translation. It's an opportunity to explain that and actually tell people what the Tibetan word is, what yeah. it means in context, and hash it out a little bit more. And mm -hmm. that this gives people an opportunity to gather more information and more understanding when they go and they read something else. Mm -hmm. so they say, oh, okay, this word's referring to this particular experience in this context, because mm -hmm. they've read that explanation. Yeah. It'll become useful information for people who, you know, are going to want to read a bunch of books because you know everybody's like it's one of the you know one of the first questions people always ask me oh like what book should i read <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I think uh you might have more options so that when i get that question i'm it's pretty challenging uh <laughs> but the the dow is a bit of a, a mess in the in the west it, um i think there's a um, in the uh, Tibetan, uh, in relationship to the Tibetan text, there appears to me, with much less exposure and experience, to be um, at least somebody being extremely rigorous, <laughs> you know, at at each, at each point of the way. Um, so I, I envy that sometimes. And, and, uh, my interaction with the Tibetan lineages. Yeah, we do have the we have the perk of you know having some we have core texts that you know are universally considered reliable, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So this is this is very nice. Yeah. yeah. The works of Longchenpa, the tantras themselves, and so on. Yeah. These are considered to be the things that we can rely on, they're treated as being like the words of the Buddha. 
yeah. for example, like as the Buddha's passing away, his students are of course very sad. He says, oh, you know, don't worry. I'm paraphrasing. I'm sure the Buddha wasn't like, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't be sad. In the future, I will appear as words and meanings, mm -hmm. syllables. Yeah. So we have other people that are awakening, like Rong Champa, and then can compose texts that cover the entire span of the teachings. Mm -hmm. These are reliable representations of the Buddha in our world today. How do you relate to um, the contrast between the simplicity of the essential teaching and the vast uh, array of uh, expressions, um, even in a, um, a teacher like Longchenpa teaching so clearly, you know, just manifesting from the source. Um, it's a lot of words and it's a lot of um, different ways of uh, saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, complicated. What's that? Oh, becoming, yeah. yeah. Well, so do you think that is because uh, it's what uh, humans need, in a sense, because we start out complicated, or or is it um, uh, kind of an abundance of celebratory expression, uh, just an enthusiasm in a way? Um, yeah. How do you receive that? I think there are a couple of different factors, really. I think that you know, like I said, people are complicated. So yeah. the diversity of people's experiences, and I've discovered this very clearly since I've been trying to explain the teachings, is that different methods and different explanations, different terms, these are going to have different impacts on other people based upon their circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, like one person might listen to an explanation of something where I'm explaining the meaning of a term or something and be completely overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Just be like, now I'm, now what do I do, you know? Yeah. Whereas another person might be like, oh, I've, that makes so much more sense now. They might have this kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I can use an example. I can use a symbol, like a, a crystal or something to try to convey meaning. Mm -hmm. And for one person, they'll be like, now I get it. That makes some sense to me. Right. Everybody else, you know, everybody else in the room might be like, well, why is this guy talking about a crystal? You know? Yeah. So this level of diversity, I think, makes it necessary that we have a vast expression of the meaning. Yeah. And then I think you kind of pointed to another one. I think there is definitely an element of the composer of a text expression of their understanding, their joy in that understanding. And oftentimes what we see in Long Chapa too is maybe a little bit of the, the joy in refuting other people's misunderstandings and things like this. Yeah. But I think that also plays a role in this kind of thing. Right, right. Reformative and, directive. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that you know it's really important for us to always return to the, right, remembering what the problem is, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? Our problem is suffering, dukkha, samsara. Mm -hmm. Why do we have this problem? We have this problem because our minds are always proliferating concepts about everything, judging and thinking, and then based upon these concepts and judging and thinking and so on and so forth, we're then engaging in chitana, volitional action, and this accumulates karma, and this is what leads to this calcifying experience of our afflictions and samsara and perpetuating itself and so on. So this kind of proliferation, this is our habit. Right. This is what we do. This is what we've always done. So having a proliferation of explanations mm -hmm. that help us to reverse that process mm -hmm. seems pretty natural, right? Sure. 
And uh, one element in the Dzogchen teachings that uh, was new to me when I encountered it um, was using exhaustion as a tool. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I suppose there might be some element of that as well. Like we're gonna uh, massage out all your misunderstandings in this category, in this category, in this category. Um, and uh, you know, you'll be you'll be empty. It's sort of like hot yoga, you know. You'll be empty, uh, empty-minded at the end, uh, one way or the other. Yeah, and it's also you know, it's these texts. Initially, we treat them as as an explanation, right? We're like, okay, these texts explain, so that I can have knowledge. Mm. And that's of course true. That's a part of their function. Yeah. But another aspect of the path that's crucial for serious practitioners is that you should always be examining your knowledge personally, right? So this means that you're looking at your own mind, you're observing yourself, you're observing your own habits and things like this. Mm -hmm. And then you go and you read through, you study, you have some kind of experience, and then you look at one of these texts by Long Champa, and then you read something that corresponds with what your experience on the path is. Mm -hmm. And these are ways that you can make sure that you aren't experiencing diversion or something mm -hmm. like this. So they also function as very useful guides mm -hmm. as you continue to actually develop real knowledge instead mm -hmm. of knowledge that's accumulated in an intellectual way. Mm -hmm. So this aspect of study that doesn't doesn't necessarily get talked about very much, but this aspect of study where you're continuously going back and reviewing and examining your experience and cross-referencing that experience mm -hmm. across various different texts, right? Yeah. Like this is very useful for at the very least developing confidence in one's own path, right? Yeah. So you're back to saying you have some kind of experience that's developing for you. You go and you look up in, you know, the Treasury of Citations, Long Chumpa's commentary on the Chings, that you look up the section in that particular text that corresponds with something that came up in your practice. And then you read that and then cross-reference it with the Riparangshar Tantra, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. And now you're actually starting to really look at your own experience based upon the cortex of the tradition. Mm -hmm. and if you're fortunate enough to be able to actually have collaboration with your teacher also, you're really getting this very, you're getting a very full plate of the teachings. Yeah. Right? Like your experience of the teachings becomes like one of those Brazilian steakhouses where you have the little card on the table where it's like green just means keep it coming. And then, you know, the you flip it to the red side, it means, hold on, I need a bit of a break. Mm -hmm. Now your plate is very full. Mm -hmm. Because you're no longer just kind of, you're, you don't have to rely on speculation and remaining in doubt anymore. Because mm -hmm. you have all the resources at your disposal to take your practice to the place where you can go beyond your doubts and have real confidence in your own liberation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have two follow-up questions. One, um, is there a way in which the text is also um, considered a uh, a kind of presencing of of the teaching itself, like a like like an icon painting is is not a picture of, but it is the thing, you know. Um, is, the, is there uh, that understanding either uh, the way you see it or traditionally? Yeah, I think there is definitely this kind of attitude mm -hmm. with various different texts in our tradition, in Tibetan Buddhism in general, and then specifically in Dzogchen teachings, we also have this kind of, this kind of feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, it's something like the Dratel Yura, the root tantra, the root Dzogchen tantra. 
this is like the definitive expression of all teachings in the world, right? It's the root tantra because this is the root from which all of the teachings arise is from this meaning, right? So it's something very sacred, both in its content, its words and meaning, mm -hmm. but also as a manifestation of the awakened activity of Buddhasamatta Bhadra in the multiverse, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have something like this as an item on your shrine that you revere and so on. Mm -hmm. And we also see this if if you're familiar with these kinds of lineage tree tankas that we see that are usually associated as a visualization support for things like nundro practice. For example, you know, you've got like the Longchen Ningtig Nundro and everything like this. And you have the central figure of Guru Rinpoche. And then behind them, you have these stacks of books. Mm. Because the books, this Sikh and Dun, like I said before, this is actually the Buddha mm. of the world, mm -hmm. right? This is the manifestation of the Buddha. It's also said that, you know, Adi Buddha Samanta Bhadra benefits sentient beings in two main ways. The first is through supreme Nirmanakaya manifestations, actually manifesting in this form that sentient beings can interact with, like Garab Dorje, for example, in mm. this world, a human being. Mm. And then it's through the teachings themselves. Mm. So Garab Dorje appears as a natural Nirmanakaya, Nirmanakaya manifestation of Adi Buddha Samanta Bhadra, mm -hmm. teaches the tantras. And now we have the tantras. We have these books present in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we have practitioners who encountered Garab Dorje and these teachings who have become realized themselves. Mm -hmm. And then this cycle perpetuates. And this is handed down through the lineage. Mm -hmm. So this is how the Buddha benefits beings, is through their manifestation, their form, and through the teachings themselves. Mm -hmm. So we hold all of these books to be incredibly sacred and really this can, this can be extended to any kind of print medium, whether or not you like it, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> because print medium, any kind of book or anything, it contains syllables. And when those syllables are arranged in the proper way, mm -hmm. it conveys sound and meaning. And sound and meaning through syllables and the expression of language is how human beings are able to integrate the teachings into their own mind and take them to heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, in your direct experience or in uh, anecdotes, or stories and texts, is there also a um, uh, a sense that this sound and meaning can be um, in a sense received without uh, like directly like uh, either in the presence of, or like in the house in which somebody uh, who was fully realized ascended or however that might get drawn. Um, is there a, um, a relationship to a kind of mode of transmission um, in which on one hand, the sound and meaning uh, compositions, vessels um, can carry it to you, but it it uh, it feels to me like there's um, like it need not be so literal as that. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I think <clears throat> there are there are several examples of this kind of phenomenon in the tradition too, where we have people who maybe have been around a lot of words and meanings for example, mm -hmm. and not really having things click in that kind of way, but mm -hmm. it'll be a different kind of experience for them in which they discover 
in a real way. Kind of like I was describing before this experience that I had singing the song of the Vajra. I had this experience, right? Uh, there's also, there's a very good story that I like about Patrul Rinpoche and his student, Nyosho Lungtok. And they, you know, they were both, of course, very astute practitioners. And Nyosho Lungtok had, you know, been, of course, receiving many teachings and reading many books and so on. But the story goes that they're, you know, they're on retreat in the wilderness somewhere. And it's one night and they're laying outside on their backs on the ground, kind of looking up at the stars. It's a very romantic scene. Yeah. And there's dogs barking off in the distance. And Patrol and Pache says something very simple. He's like, oh, do you hear these dogs barking? Mm -hmm. And then he's like, this is the nature of your mind, right? Kind of this kind of example, yeah. this kind of direct introduction. And the story is that Nyosho Lungtuk in this moment of integrating with sound and this recognition that the sound of the dogs barking and his mind are undifferentiated, mm -hmm. his consciousness manifesting its potentiality as this experience of sound. Mm -hmm. He kind of got it, right? So teachers spend their lives talking for the most part, explaining things with words and meanings. Yeah. Any sort of experience of body, voice, mind can actually be the moment when the student has this experience for themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, you know, one of the other things that's very difficult about the teacher's job, you know, is because Lung Champa, for example, he's talking about this discovery, he talks about this natural state, the discovery of the way things are. And he's describing it as being inexpressible, ineffable, and so on. Mm -hmm. So teachers spend their lives explaining many, many things in many different ways so that students can have this discovery for themselves. Yeah. Right? No one can give it to you. Yeah. Like even the Buddha explains this in the sutras. He explains, I can't liberate you. Mm -hmm. I can't reach down and pluck you up mm -hmm. into some sort of state of liberation. The best I can do is show you the path. Mm -hmm. And this is the hard part. Mm -hmm of practicing any path really like yeah. if the buddha had the capacity to liberate all sentient beings he would have right right, right. but the best he could do is explain mm -hmm. and use symbols to mm -hmm. try to give meaning but the student has to work with those explanations and the methods and the symbols in order to really discover for themselves mm -hmm. And maybe sort of like we were talking about with the um, multitude of expressions, uh, you know, providing all these opportunities for an almost accidental discovery. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have this, we have both, right? We have all kinds of methods that are very intentional mm -hmm. in bringing about this experience. But every moment and every experience is an opportunity to wake up. Mm -hmm. to, discover this natural state because no matter what kind of experience you're in, whether you perceive something as positive or negative, you have some sort of sensation that you feel is pleasant or unpleasant, mm -hmm. your Rigpa, your instant presence never wavers from its own natural state, from its own place. It's unimpacted by this. Right. So our mind is always grasping and reaching toward these experiences and reaching outward in this way. Mm -hmm. So you discover this state that is always present without this kind of grasping. And then you have this kind of knowledge, right? Yeah. I wonder how... Um... You and your own reflection, or maybe there's a um, traditional application of a particular orientation. Um, integrate the um, 
and a paradox of the um, eternal aspect, the timelessness aspect of um, the natural state um, with this experience of progression and a discovery moment and a before and after that discovery moment and uh, or or however you might try to um, uh, it strikes me that um, the integrating that aspect because part of of course what we do is we you know we make these uh, discoveries or openings or new understandings and then you know there's some work involved in um, sort of moving that new uh, experiential understanding back through all of the uh, ways that we see the world and ways that we experience the world. And uh, one that seems particularly uh, challenging to me to integrate um, in, a, in a joyful, interesting, absurdist kind of way um, is uh, the timelessness of um, pure knowing. Yeah, so we have this uh, this understanding of time versus timelessness, right? Mm -hmm. Time in general is always based on some sort of reference point. It's always referential. Right? Time is passing. We have this kind of imaginary chronology that we experience all the time. And even the idea of timelessness Timelessness is based upon the concept of there being a time, a time frame. Sure. So they're both limitations, right? And in Dzogchen teachings, we're going beyond all limitations, any kind of extremes whatsoever of time, timelessness, mm -hmm. any kind of existing, non-existing, one and many. They're all these kinds of, they're all false dichotomies in that they're based on some sort of reference point that by default is imputing self and other right mm -hmm. and then habitually reifies that imputation over mm -hmm. and over and over again so when we think about and the way that we this is sometimes expressed is the fourth time which then people see this and they're like oh that sounds really cool like there's like another dimension of time and really it just means that you're in this state that's totally free from any point of reference. Mm -hmm. It's completely free from any kind of limitation mm -hmm. of time, timelessness, and so on. And when you're in that state, this is instant presence, trikjo, so on. This is actually mm -hmm. being in a state of Dzogchen. But mm -hmm. then what happens? Then we become distracted. We start engaging in our normal kind of proliferation again. Mm -hmm. Norbert Rinpoche would say that if you're in this state of instant presence, you are no longer in transmigration because you're completely free from these limitations, even if that's momentary. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you fall back into this habit. But the path for a Dzogchen practitioner is to keep returning to those moments. Mm -hmm. And this is what real stability is in your practice as a Dzogchen practitioner. It doesn't mean that you can, you know, sit and gaze at the sky for hours and then have some sort of idea of stability, right? Because again, you're basing your practice on time. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I can meditate for two hours. This is a limitation, right? Mm -hmm. If you have this capacity to return to this state that's beyond limitations over and over and over and over again, this means you have stability. And mm -hmm. then eventually you are able to sustain that state and it becomes less and less fragmented. And as it becomes less and less fragmented, your qualities of your practice start to manifest themselves. And mm -hmm. then eventually you're in that state all the time. And this is Buddha. Mm -hmm. So methodologically, Dzogchen can be very, very simple. Mm -hmm. But it takes great diligence in order to actually apply it properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's a good answer. Part, part of the answer is uh, that it's not a problem. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, made up, it's a problem that we make up for ourselves, right? Yeah. 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 The um, integrating is to understand that it's not a problem in, in a sense. Yeah. That's, a, that's not so easy, though. You know, a lot of times we kind of we have a hard time realizing that things that we think are a problem really aren't that much of a problem, right? right. right. <laughs> and and even if we get there logically, it's hard to uh, uh, make that ripple through the rest of uh, the ways right. that we understand. That's, that's our habit, right? Like yeah. our our fixations, the things that we cling to, they're not just sense objects, right? A lot of times practitioners get this kind of idea. They're like, oh, I'm attached to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm attached to, you know, this kind of food or this feeling of attraction that I have for this particular person or something like this. Mm -hmm. And then we, we're always projecting outward in this way, even when we're identifying something as a problem. But just as significant is the way that we cling to our ideas about the way things are. Mm -hmm. So the more we can free ourselves from this burden of tension, of clinging, mm -hmm. the more relaxed we can be, the more present we become, and so on. Mm -hmm. But this is very difficult. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, well, I'm beginning to be aware of time uh, uh, for you, really, yeah. but um, uh, maybe there's a short answer to... Um, I meant to ask earlier um, if there are kind of um, if Trollcore style practices are part of uh, what's been interesting to you and productive for you and or uh, what you teach for your students um, and are that the 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 uh, equivalent practice in our paths I found. Um, you know, can uh, can make progress more reliable and smooth in in uh, in good ways. Uh, and so, I'm curious if that has been your experience, or if it's more of a, a different um, lineage in practice. Yeah, I'm very interested in uh, physical practices, and I find them mm -hmm. very useful for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the Dzogchen practice and the understanding of anatomy in the body, it's its the same as we see in uh, Vajrayana practices, it's the same as we see in a lot of other yogic traditions or things like this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the unique features of Dzogchen teachings is how to directly tap into that manifestation of your physical dimension in order to discover the natural state. Mm -hmm. But we still apply these kinds of methods in order to accommodate this to make this easier mm -hmm. which might be a little bit contradictory because you're applying some sort of effort sometimes this effort's mm -hmm. very strenuous but when you can actually coordinate the energy of your physical body through movement like asana mm -hmm. and you're coordinating the movement of the vayu in your body by joining asana with breathing mm -hmm. since the movement of our consciousness is connected with the movement of the vayu mm -hmm. We're coordinating all of our energy in this way. Yeah. And this makes it very useful for practitioners yeah. in this kind of context. And also, I find that it's incredibly important for Dzogchen practitioners to do everything they can to be very mindful about things like diet and lifestyle mm -hmm. and physical activity. Because mm -hmm. if you're too if you're experiencing obstacles connected with your physical body, your well-being, your the environment that you're in, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to practice. Mm -hmm. So integrating these kinds of practices into your life is very useful. Yeah. Cool. Well, I've got plenty more questions, but I, I feel like um, uh, I've held you uh, for a lot of time already. Um, but I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks so much. Yeah, I had a great time. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to chat again if you want to sometime. Yeah, I'd love it. Um, so um, 
Wrong Girl Foundation, is it .org or, or something? Uh, how, yeah. how can folks uh, track you down? I'll put it, of course, in the description as well. But Yeah, let me just make sure I've got some. <laughs> yeah, wronggirlfoundation.org. Okay. And yeah, wronggirlfoundation.org. And, you know, we've got, we do an annual uh, protocol retreat every winter, sort of around the new year that's coming up. And then you mentioned the flight of the Garuda course, which starts next January uh -huh. and regular weekly programs for anybody who's interested. Uh -huh. And people can uh, just join any time as far as the weekly programs go. People are welcome to join anytime. You know, they're, we're always using some sort of a text, but I always am explaining mm -hmm. in the sessions that it's not like a book club, right? Mm -hmm. The intention is that someone gets something useful out of every session that they can apply to their path. Right. wherever they're at in the book. So people can join at any time. Yeah, great. Well, right. well, good. So we'll, um, uh, we'll wrap up and look forward to the next time. Go ahead and end the stream. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Ian. It was nice to meet you. You, you too.